Welcome to the Low Carb Conferences podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Jeff Gerber. And our special guest today is Dr. Nader Ali, who will be uh, joining us at our conference in February. He's been a big supporter of, of it in the past. How are you today, Nader? I'm excellent and I'm delighted I'm part of your conference because I really enjoy networking and being there. Well, great to have you, Nader. So a little history, Nader is an interventional cardiologist with nearly three decades of clinical experience. His passion over the last decade has been that of prevention in the setting of clinical cardiology. He has an extensive experience on the effects of diet on cholesterol and lipoprotein in those with and without pre-existing heart disease. He's an advocate for change in public health guidelines away from prescriptive medicine through educating healthcare professionals about the benefits of carbohydrate-restricted diets. Nader also lectures and shares informative information on his YouTube channel, Eat Mostly Fats. So Nader, if you can provide us with a bit more background, both personally and professionally, and how you became interested in preventive medicine. That's a good beginning. Uh, I would say the reason I got interested in uh, preventive medicine is because all my life I have been very active, physically active. And I found that sometime in the year 2011 to 2012, I was gaining weight. I would do about 10,000 miles of cycling per year. And I was getting to about 180 pounds. And I could not shake off that weight no matter what I did. It would go down and climb back up again. And that's when I was hearing a podcast about a low carb diet. And I said, this makes so much sense as to why it would work and why should I not try it on myself? So that's the first time I tried it sometime in, I think it was December of 2012. Uh, and uh, within six months, I went down to about 160 pounds without really even trying and enjoying the diet that I ate. So I said, hey, if this works for me, why not try it on my patients? And as soon as I started trying it on my patients, it became a passion. I said, this is where I'm going to be most effective at, and this is how I can help people. And then one thing led to another. I became more involved in evaluating their lipid profiles, seeing their health improve, seeing them becoming non-diabetics, and that led to a different paradigm on how to evaluate lipoprotein profiles, gave me an in-depth understanding of what cholesterol does and what statins do and how they may or may not help. In my mind, they really don't help. And that's how over this time I have evolved. And the last 10 years that I have been practicing uh, my knowledge and expertise in this area has stepwise increased exponentially. And I, I don't need to, I don't want to toot my own, own horn, but in the last 10 years, I've been pretty consistent. I've seen roughly about 100 patients per week. That's a lot of patients. So my clinical experience with seeing patients with these disorders, heart disease, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, obesity is quite extensive. And although I may not have written books and articles, clinically, I know how to evaluate this area and that's where my strength is. And that's where I want to focus my time. And that's why I like people like Jeff who are like-minded, who are away from prescriptive medicines, who want to spread this knowledge to the medical professions professionals as well as uh, general public. And that's why I love joining his conference and meeting people and spreading the knowledge. Great, Nader. Well, you know, it's uh, a typical story for <laughs> healthcare professionals that we discovered the low-carb diet on our own. It's, it's kind of unfortunate that uh, we have to teach ourselves uh, the, the science behind this. 
And um, you come in from a very unique position. And again, you're not the only cardiologist has, who has, in a sense, turned to the dark side and look, looking at heart disease and cardiovascular risk in a different way. But it's also uh, profound. At the beginning, you, you said that I've come to realize that, that, that statins don't seem to help. And, um, you know, we'll ask you maybe to talk a, a little bit more about that. As a primary care doctor, I look at the same evidence. And so the question is, along with a proper diet, is there any benefit to medication, both in primary prevention, that is in individuals who aren't diagnosed with heart disease, and those in secondary prevention that have already um, had, a, had a cardiovascular event? Those are very good questions and they require thoughtful answers because you don't want to say something negative about several published trials. You wanna be objective. You want to tell the story as it is. And as a physician, I feel that it is a joint decision. It's a it's a decision between the patient and the physician in the sense that you want to empower the patient to make the right decision for themselves. So when the question of statin comes up and let's say, let's pick up secondary prevention and let's define secondary prevention. Secondary prevention is in somebody who's already got a stent or, or has had bypass surgery or has had a myocardial infarction. So in this group of patients, the best clinical trial is the FOREST trial, the uh, Scandinavian simvastatin trial, and it was completed in 1994. It was done under the ausp auspices of Merck, so there is some conflict of interest because they sponsored the trial, they collected the data, they had their own biostatisticians, and when you look at the trial and you dissect it down, you find that the degree of benefit, and I think when you talk about degree of benefit, you should talk about mortality reduction from cardiac causes. And to break it into simple layman's terms, if you treated 100 people with a statin in this group, you will save 0 0.6 lives per year. So what that means is that 99.4 did not benefit, a little more than half a person benefited in terms of mortality reduction. In my mind, that is a very small improvement. And that small improvement comes at the cost of an increased risk of myopathy, worsening of your diabetes, perhaps some cognitive decline, perhaps erectile dysfunction. And if you look at subgroup analysis in this population that's been done by David Diamond, and he's been a stellar person who's helped the low carb community as well, you find that that benefit is restricted to the group of people who are severely insulin resistant. And insulin resistance can be looked at from a lipoprotein profile standpoint as well, if you see people with high triglycerides and low HDL, these are insulin resistant people. And that's the only group that seemed to have benefited in that clinical trial. So when I am giving a drug to a patient who may take it for a couple of decades, in some cases up to five decades, I want to tell them the degree of benefit in terms of absolute risk reduction, not relative risk reduction, which is an exaggerated form of benefit, and empower the patient to decide whether he wants to pursue that or pursue a non-prescriptive option like nutrition, fasting, and exercise. So I would say many of my patients will then come to decide that, hey, maybe the degree of benefit is not what I initially thought, and maybe for my particular situation, this is not worth it. 
I can tell you as a cardiologist, if my doctor were giving me those options and those kinds of odds and telling me about the side effects, which are supposedly not very frequent, but in my clinical practice, I see myopathy very often. I see cognitive dysfunction quite often. There is an epidemic of erectile dysfunction present. I would say, no, I don't want to consider taking a statin. So I want patients to be armed with that knowledge because as a medical professional and according to Medicare guidelines, when you're doing something that is that important in, in somebody's life, they should have informed consent. This is the way informed consent is done. And I think that is the right way to practice medicine. That's that's beautiful, Nader. We, 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 a couple of questions about that. So you're basically saying, and you know, as a cardiologist, the majority of your patients are probably in the secondary prevention category as, as you uh, described. And so uh, you would have to put hundreds and hundreds of your patients on statins for just a very few, say, I think you said 0.6% to, to get a benefit. And then there's all these side effects. Now, you mm -hmm. also mentioned that from the 4S trial, perhaps it was insulin resistance that was the protective factor. I don't know if 4S really specifically looked into that, but I know that's that's a focus of, of David Diamond. But generally, I look at these the, the trials for medication with all else being equal. All you do is just give them a statin. But the added uh, benefit is that you're addressing lifestyle and diet. But you know, I have to ask... Can you compare your patient population to some of your other cardiology colleagues and to show, you know, are your patients living longer? Or are they having less cardiovascular mortality? I know you don't do research, but that's certainly a question we would love to, to uh, have answered. So of course, whatever I'm going to say is going to be anecdotal, uh, as you mentioned, because there is no rigorous uh, evaluation we have done of my patients compared to anybody else's. But I can say that in the last 10 years, I have not seen any person from my practice end up having a cardiac event because of the lifestyle they chose. Like in other words, they go on a fasting diet, they go on a diet that is uh, devoid of refined uh, carbs and sugar. Uh, they get into a physical exercise regimen. And I have not seen an adverse cardiac event as a result of that. The second thing is that I have not seen an increase in cardiac events in people who have stopped their statins. So it's not like in, I can say that, hey, I have seen a definite correlation in people who come to me, evaluate the risk benefits of statins, stop them, and then end up having a cardiac event. So at least that has not been my observation. I feel pretty comfortable with the way I address these issues. And of course, I'm standing on the shoulders of several giants. Like if I were doing this kind of treatment in early 2000, when Marianne DeMassey came out with her 60 Minutes Australia program and questioned about statins and that kind of led to a tailspin in her career. And then Tim Noakes, because of his uh, advocacy, got sued for his nutritional advice. I'm in a little protected space because all these people have done work for me ahead of time. And so when I go ahead and give my evaluation and come to a, a empowered decision with my patients, I would say that I'm in a little safer space compared to my colleagues. Now, over time, over the last 10 years, what has happened is that I have been referred because either because of my YouTube channels or because of the talk that I gave at Low Carb Denver, uh, which really was a coming out talk for me. Uh, Jeff uh, invited me and that talk has been viewed more than a million times on YouTube. 
So it makes me a little bit infamous. The patient population that is graduating to come towards seeing me are a group of people who are already motivated to do fasting, already motivated to cut out refined carbs and sugar, already motivated to exercise. So it makes my job easier. So I think that people who come to follow me are doing better metabolically in terms of cardiac events and in terms of their overall health, because it's a self-selected population that is now beginning to follow me a lot more than people who are sort of wanting to follow mainstream medicine advice, if that makes any sense. Yes, Nader. So I'm, I'm glad that uh, we, we've helped you to uh, uh, have people in the low carb community get to, get to know you over the years. And, uh, you know, I, it would be great if, if we could have people come in and actually look at, at our data. And of course it's an anecdotal, but uh, all, I mean, we could do some case studies at, at, at some point. And, you know, as you know, I've been uh, doing this for almost 25 years and, you know, I, I, I can recall case after case of patients that um, we have um, kept them healthy, reversed diabetes and prevented uh, heart attacks. And again, um, you know, I just wonder if there's any pushback in, in your community, but I do want to just tell the audience that, uh, again, this is just a, a conversation. This is general advice. And we, we don't want to, we want to encourage people not to make any changes in their medical treatments or stop medication because of, you know, what we're, we're hearing today. For myself, um, I still have conversations with patients, as you say, and we want them to be well informed and to make incision uh, decisions. And um, you know, I don't totally take patients off statins, and I'm sure you still have some patients that are on statins. And we have the discussion, and and um, we just make a choice. But I, I just wonder about uh, you know uh, pushback in your community. Uh, with what you're doing with your patient population? The pushback has gotten less. In the beginning, when I used to do it, I, I got reported to the medical staff that I'm doing something illegal. Um, people wrote that this is a patient of this physician who is presented with a cardiac event to the hospital without a statin. And I wrote back saying that, yeah, but that was one patient. And there are these 10 patients of yours who have come to the hospital with a cardiac event on statins. So it, it is hard to use an anecdotal case and, and say that it's, there's, a cause and cause, uh, there's a causality in that. I, I keep telling people that Cardiac disease is multifactorial. There are so many variables that lead to heart disease, not just lipid profile, but stress, sleep, insulin resistance, inflammation. These are major factors. And I even keep telling them that tomorrow, if I end up having a cardiac event, you should not automatically assume that this is a low-carb cardiologist who is a practicing low-carb cardiologist himself, whose LDL levels range in the high 250s, whose triglyceride levels are low, whose HDL level is high, and his cardiac event was as a result of high LDL. As a physician, I'm exposed to volume stress. I have to see a large number of patients. I'm exposed to stress from taking care of patients in the cardiac cath lab, coming in with cardiac events, myocardial infarctions, dealing with life and death situations. My sleep can be compromised. So there are so many factors that can lead an individual to end up having heart disease. So one should be cautious and not extrapolating too much into one particular, one particular variable and say that's what is causing heart disease. I think in my mind is that the grassroots grassroot movements in terms of evaluating one's own health through metabolic parameters, through getting knowledge from conferences like Low Carb Denver, from gathering some of this information has leveled the playing field between physicians and consumers of medicine. 
And so I think it's the grassroots movement that's going to change our paradigm in terms of what is important for our cardiac health, and it's going to protect people like me. And that grassroots movements would be focused on insulin resistance, would be focused on inflammation, would be focused on lipoprotein quality, and not necessarily what your LDL level is. Because just in my mind right now, I can recall a hundred patients that I have who have an LDL level above 250, who have maintained a calcium score of zero over the last three years. I can look at many people who have a high LDL level in their 250s untreated, who have not had a cardiac event in the last decade. So there are so many variables that we don't understand. But we are in a much better place now than we were even 10 years ago. And I think that this paradigm is going to get more refined and better as more and more research happens in this field. Great, great, Nader. Well, um, th those are wonderful comments. I, I don't really feel that I get pushback in the community. Rather, you know, I, I think we're known for... Um, helping patients in terms of prevention and the other doctors appreciate that. And we have the patients go out and tell the, uh, their other doctors, their cardiologists, their specialists that, that uh, they're approaching lifestyle and diet with low carb Mediterranean. And the doctors say, well, Mediterranean diet sounds healthy. So we, we kind of like temper the blow in terms of what we're doing in terms of pushback. I, I think it's just an issue with the insurance companies that they, they, they come back and they say, well, why isn't the patient on, on these, these particular medications? And then we have to provide explanations that sometimes might be suitable or not. And we can actually get dinged for not putting patients on, on statins and so forth. And, you know, I feel as a primary care doctor, I, I, I perhaps might be more protected than you as a cardiologist, but perhaps not that I'm, I'm, we're, we're probably in the same boat. <laughs> We, we are in a much better situation now than we were 10 years ago. Yeah. We would have gotten a lot more pushback 10 years ago. Yeah. And I, I also have to say that uh, uh, you had mentioned that, that all the stress in your life as a, as a, uh, as a cardiologist, practicing, car practicing cardiologist, but uh, I, I need to mention that the audience, to the audience, that you're very humble, very kind, very caring. And I think you're, you're very mindful in the life, in your life, and you have things in check. So kudos. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I, 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 uh, I feel humbled by the kind of uh, work I'm able to do and the gratification I feel from taking care of people. So it's a mutual feeling. Thank you. You're welcome. And so a little bit more about secondary prevention. There's so many things we could talk about. Uh, we could we could look at PCSK9 inhibitors, which are the injectable medication for lowering cholesterol. And you know that this is kind of the new, latest, greatest. And what your thoughts on are on those medications? This is an area that kind of just uh, gives me a kind of spark. And I want to be uh, as objective as possible because PCSK9 inhibitors, when you look at it from a couple of different standpoints, let's look at it from a, bi from a biologic standpoint as to what is PCSK9 and what does it do? So PCSK9 is a protein that the liver makes. And among one of its roles is to go and bind to an LDL receptor. Now we're getting a little geeky, but it's pretty straightforward. The liver has LDL receptors that are sucking up the LDL, the so-called bad cholesterol. And I call it, I call LDL the other good cholesterol. But basically the PCSK9 comes in and binds to the receptor that is sucking up the LDL from circulation in the liver and it destroys the receptor. So once it destroys the receptor, the LDL remains in circulation and the LDL is higher. And LDL being high does not go with a paradigm that high LDL 
causes heart disease and hence you need to reduce the LDL. And that's the advent of the PCSK9 inhibitors because what PCSK9 inhibitors do is that they remove PCSK9 from circulation. The LDL receptor gets overexpressed. The LDL cholesterol is removed from circulation and everybody's happy thinking that they have done something very good. But let's examine this a little further. There are animal studies done in which you do exactly what the PCSK9 inhibitors do. And if you look at this group of animals, they are at higher risk of becoming diabetic. They are at higher risk of getting visceral obesity. That means the kind of obesity in which there is fat in your liver, there is fat in your pancreas, basically abdominal obesity. And you have even higher fat depositions in your heart. So you would say, why is that the case? So again, I'm getting a little bit more scientific here, but what PCSK9 does is that it removes the receptor from the liver and from the pancreas that is sucking up a lipoprotein molecule from the circulation that is not just cholesterol filled, but fat filled. So if you have no PCSK9, then these receptors get overexpressed. The fat is removed from the circulation into your liver, into your pancreas, giving you a fatty pancreas and a fatty liver. Okay, the second piece of evidence is people who are born with a genetic PCSK9 deficiency. So these are people as if they're taking a PCSK9 inhibitor. So if you look at those group of individuals, they have a higher risks of being a diabetic. They are on an average higher weight than a normal population. And they have higher incidence of visceral obesity for all the reasons that I pointed out to you. Then the final piece of evidence that I want to discuss is the PCSK9 trials that Jeff was talking about. And when you look at PCSK9 trials, the Fourier trial, or even the Odyssey trial, but let's take Fourier. They recruited some 28,000 patients. 28,000 patients is a lot. They gave a PCSK9 inhibitor called Repatha, and they dropped the LDL levels to 30 milligrams per deciliter. Now, 30 milligrams per deciliter for people who know about LDL is very low. It's almost close to zero. The control group had about between 90 and 100. And mind you, there are 14,000 patients in this group and 14,000 patients in, in this group. And if you take that larger number and you show absolutely no mortality reduction. In fact, a little higher mortality in this group, a little lower mortality in this group, that would be considered as an abject failure. So I have pointed out that there are animal studies with PCSK9 inhibitors that show that you are at higher risk of diabetes, you are at higher risk of visceral obesity. There are human genetic trials in populations that show the same thing. And then you try PCSK9 in a human population and you show no mortality reduction in 28,000 patients. And when you do that, you got to admit that it is abject failure. You should not spin the data and say, this drug is beneficial. So the, the, the spin was that uh, there were less events and they kind of pushed aside the mortality, uh, not a benefit. <laughs> They, they push right. the mortality data on the on the side, which they tend to do. And um, yeah, I, I love not, or even I, I was able to follow. So one of the things that you love to do in your presentations is get very technical. And, you know, I, we always have to wa warn the audience, but at the end, you really summarize it and make it uh, very simple for almost everybody to understand. No, thank you. Thank you. I've been accused of being a nerd and I have to live with it. Yeah, well... <laughs> That's that's okay. We we love nerds, Nader. So we we haven't even talked about primary prevention, 
and um you should do that though if you have time sure uh, yeah we have a little bit more time so what are your yeah. thoughts about the you know primary prevention and and how we should approach that actually they the people would benefit a lot more from listening to this podcast because two physicians are talking and they know exactly what the audience would be interested in. And I hope that I live up in my talk at Low Carb Denver and that people would not say, hey, he didn't live up to what he did in the podcast. Uh, but primary prevention is important and we should uh, look at it because the data for primary prevention is even more tenuous. And if you collect all the data, you come across certain very important points. Number one point is that primary prevention does not seem to help women in terms of mortality reduction whatsoever. So there is no clinical trial that shows mortality reduction in women for primary prevention. So let's define primary prevention. Primary prevention means somebody who's not had a cardiac event, like no heart attacks, no stents, no bypass surgery. Now, people ask me, well, I do have some plaque buildup because I have a calcium score that is a certain amount, so that indicates that I have plaque buildup. That person, if they have not had a cardiac event, would still fall in the category of primary prevention. But let's make it a little simpler for some people, and let's take the data that you have zero calcium score. If you have zero calcium score, there are studies that point out that even up to about a decade with statins and zero calcium score, you get no benefit. So if you have a zero calcium score in the right clinical setting, because there's some caveats to zero calcium score that we can get into if we have time, they don't need a statin. Now, if you fall outside this category, you are a middle-aged ma male, and you're taking statins for primary prevention, in that group of people, if you treated 100 people with statins for one year, in terms of mortality reduction, it will be one-tenth of 1%. One-tenth of 1%. That means 99.9 .9 would not benefit for that one year, 0.1 would benefit. Of course, that's not how it's presented to the physicians. Of course, that's not how it is presented to the, uh, to the physicians who are prescribing these drugs because they are looking at what is called relative risk reduction. And, and I love Malcolm Kendrick, and I love the way he describes relative risk reduction. The chances of winning the Texas Lotto is one in 15 million. And I come and say, I'm gonna increase your chances of winning by 100%. And my uh, patients would think, for sure, I'm going to win it. But all I'm doing is I'm increasing your chances of winning from one in 15 million to two in 15 million, because the difference between one and two is 100%. So that's why in primary prevention trials, the quoted number is 20%, 30%, depending on the trial. But when you look at absolute risk reduction, it's about one tenth of 1% for mortality reduction in 100 people treated who are middle-aged men. So on the basis of that, you're going to give a drug to somebody for about 30 to 50 years. Is that something that you want to make a decision as a physician on your own? Do you want to empower the patient to make the right decision? Do you want to discuss with the patient about the potential side effects? I think that's where our medical profession is lacking in terms of critical thinking for themselves. I think we rely too much on key opinion leaders, on societies to make decisions for us, but we should really be making decisions for our patients on our own through our own critical thinking. And I hope that that's the, that's the goal you have with your conference. You want to empower, because in all the conferences I have attended that you have organized, you are trying to educate the medical community. You're not just trying to give information to the general public. There is sophisticated general public that gets it. 
but your conferences are primarily targeted towards other physicians so that they can improve their practice. And that's what I love about Low Carb Denver. Yeah, it's great because we bring the general audience and healthcare professionals to kind of share ideas. And, um, you know, so that's great about the medication and, and the lack of benefit for primary prevention. So why don't we just show people studies that uh, prove that uh, a low carb diet prevents heart attacks? Why don't we just say, here's the data that, and that, that's the end of the story. What's, what's the problem with that? That data is lacking. We have a lot of surrogate markers. And of course, surrogate markers are not, not something that is definitive. But if I tell a patient that going on a low-carb diet and going on fasting will reduce your blood sugar, will drop your insulin levels, will reduce your inflammation markers, will drop your triglycerides, increase your HDL, reduce your weight, reduce your blood pressure, make you a non-diabetic. How many surrogate markers do you want to show that are moving in the right direction before you say, yeah, I am sold and I think this is going to benefit me? The problem with clinical trials and showing outcomes data is that you need somebody who is willing to sponsor these clinical trials. It used to be the NIH, the National Institute of Health, that would come to a Jeffrey Gerber and say, Dr. Gerber, we like what you're doing and we would like to give you $50 million and a staff to run a large scale study over the next 10 year period. And we want you to give us a definitive answer. Unfortunately, Uncle Sam is not looking for people like us. And most of these clinical trials are done by pharmaceutical industry that have their own agenda in terms of selling drugs and not in terms of lifestyle changes. So we're not going to get this answer anytime soon. Until then, we're going to have to rely on surrogate marker data, like for example, people with high LDL, but who are insulin sensitive, who have low inflammation, who have zero calcium score, followed over a period of time, maintain a zero calcium score. That's going to be important information. And similarly, surrogate markers on blood work, weight management, diabetes, those are the kinds of data we're going to have in the, in the near future. The long-term outcomes data is probably in my mind still about 10 years away. Great, Nader. Well, I think it's fair to say though that there's over uh, probably a hundred studies looking at low-carb diets and how they improve surrogate markers. And I think there's other studies that also suggest that if you address insulin resistance and prediabetes, that you get 10 times a benefit in heart disease reduction versus looking at cholesterol concentrations. But granted, they're just associational and you know we don't have the hard data looking at outcomes. And I think that's a fair conversation and an explanation why we just can't simply say, this diet is better than another diet in terms of heart disease uh, protection, but we do have data to show that the circuit markers doing low carb does significantly improve those surrogate markers. And I think that we need to provide balance also. And I want to give a teaser to the audience that if they come to Low Carb Denver, what I'm going to talk about is how you need to individualize the low carb diet based on a patient's clinical profile. So perhaps a generic low carb diet is not appropriate for everybody and that that low carb diet needs to be modified based on the health of your fat cells, based on your triglyceride levels, based on the level of your insulin resistance. And one of the beautiful things about the low carb community is that we are very critical of each other and we are independent thinkers and we give voice to people who come with differing, differing opinions. So what I'm going to talk about is that 
a high fat, low carb diet may not be appropriate for everyone to start out with in certain groups of people. And I think that's an important message that I want to get out. Well, that's great. And um, the same here, we don't put everybody on low carb, high fat diets. In fact, we find individuals that are insulin sensitive and, you know, we have patients that, that, that have cardiac events who were never insulin resistant. And so, you know, we have to deal with them perhaps in a different way. So we, we don't have all the answers and uh, we're, we're trying to learn as well. So we, you know, we definitely look forward to uh, your presentation at the conference. And I just have two more things, Nadir, just to finish up, although we could go on all day. And I've always wanted to ask the question about uh, Dr. Karam Nasser, who I think is in Houston with you as well. Is, is that correct? I don't know of this individual, Khurram Nasir. I think he works at Baylor. I have heard about him from several people, but I don't know him personally. Ah, well, you're going to get to meet him because we have a whole uh, section, uh, a half day devoted to, to cardiovascular disease. Oh, and awesome. Karam Nasir will be there. I And I, I, I thought that he didn't live nearby. We have um, Dave Feldman and we have um, uh, uh, David Diamond and then, of course, yourself. But uh, Karam it will be talking about... Um, uh, the calcium score that's that he's he's in clinical practice and and he's very fond of um, the heart calcium score and he's worked with Arthur Agatston and I hope he's going to be talking about some of the uh, recent uh, research coming out of uh, Denmark the Western Denmark Heart Registry um, sure. and and to hear what he has to say about those findings. I'm going to ping him here ahead of the conference so that I get a little uh, inside and in-depth information before I come there. Uh, I'll be uh, happy to connect you guys. That, that'll be awesome. Yeah. Be and awesome. and just the last thing to finish up is uh, to ask what you enjoy about uh, coming to the conferences and speaking in person. The most important thing that I get is that I network with people who are like-minded that give me different ideas. I learn a lot more outside the box. Like I learn things that I never thought I would learn. Um, and so it's an opportunity to broaden my perspective in terms of lifestyle for healthcare. The kind of innovation that the low carb community is doing is amazing. And that is the biggest advantage. And I feel that in-person conferences are much more conducive to an exchange of ideas than online conferences. And I feel bad that the pandemic somewhat stunted our growth for the last three years. And I hope that beginning of 2023, that we're gonna be able to overcome that and galvanize and increase the speed with which we can improve this area. So I'm really looking forward to in-person conferences. Well, I know you've had conferences in Houston that I've attended. Uh, I think all the, the two that you had. And uh, yeah, hopefully we can meet, move on with in-person because I, I agree it's it's just a, a unique experience to, to, uh, to gather with the general public and, and healthcare professionals. There, there's nothing like it. So Nader, how can the audience uh, find out more about you? I'm hesitant for them to find out more about me because I have not written more books, although I want to change that because I hope that in the next five years, I'm going to cut down my clinical work and focus more on writing and creating online content that my patients can uh, or individuals can access. But we have a YouTube channel, which is called Eat Mostly Fats. Uh, we have put out a lot of content out there. It, the content is at least updated every month. Uh, of course, you can look up my practice, which you can Google my name in Webster, Texas, and come see me. I was doing online consults. I learned uh, not online consults, but online conversations. Uh, but that is getting to be a little difficult in terms of the amount of time that I have to devote to them. 
So I'm planning on stopping that and focusing more time on creating content so that everybody can look at it. Um, I have a very busy clinical practice, so I'm not looking to increase it. <laughs> so I'm not inviting people to come all the way to Houston to see me. In fact, I feel like at this time, I have had my work and I need to have a different way to get my viewpoint across. Well, it's great to have you available on social media, but we really do need more ca practicing cardiologists like yourself in, in each and every town. And uh, we, we we're certain, certainly lacking that here in, uh, in Denver. But I think that the best way to increase the practicing cardiologist like this is what you are doing, is uh, inviting people to conferences and let them learn about the grassroots movement and see it for themselves that this kind of lifestyle is helping them. Um, otherwise, we're gonna just finish our tenure and finish our work and not pass it on to the next group of people. And I think the best way to do that is to spread the knowledge the way you are. At some point you have to transition and say, I have done my work and I need to do something different. Well, thank you. And if you wanna hear more from Dr. Ali and our 30 plus speakers, you can find more information about our conferences at lowcarbconferences.com. So that's all for now. And um, it's great to have you on, Nader, and uh, we'll be in touch. I enjoyed it, Jeff. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. And I can't wait to see you in, um, in spring of next year.